ஓகே எஸ் சார் நான் ரெஸ்பெக்டட் பிரசிடென்ட் எலெக்ட் டாக்டர் அபுல் ஹசன் ஸ்டேட் செக்ரட்டரி டாக்டர் என்ஆர்டி தியாகராஜன் டாக்டர் ரமேஷ் பாபு டீன் ஆஃப் ஸ்டடீஸ் ஐஎம்ஏ சிஜிபி ஹெட் குவார்டர்ஸ் டாக்டர் செங்குட்டோன் சேர்மன் ஐஎம்ஏ சிஜிபி டாக்டர் செந்தில் செக்ரட்டரி ஐஎம்ஏ சிஜிபி தமிழ்நாடு ஸ்டேட் பிரான்ச் அண்ட் அதர் ஆஃபீஸ் பேரர்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஐஎம்ஏ சிஜிபி கோர்ஸ் <laughs> on infectious disease and infection control uh, with uh, coordination of dr nemanathan uh, i hope uh, this is a very important topic and it is very much useful for all practitioners not only general practitioners even all uh, uh, specialty people also i hope uh, this cme and also this group will more help helpful for you IMA members of Tamil Nadu State Branch, I wish this uh, office bearers of IMA CGP uh, to start more uh, more courses in future and uh, conducting uh, CME with uh, very nice topics. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. thank you sir thank you very much for your appreciation and we will definitely do it now i request our honorable state secretary dr nr tr tyagarajan sir to give us address yeah good afternoon to all respected the uh, president immediate past president the, uh, dr dailal our uh, chairman uh, secretary and sir and uh, sendel and uh, to the rest of the office bearers of uh, uh, the cgp wing uh, the, the cgp wing i don't think has ever been so active uh, uh, like in any of the previous periods like uh, dr sengatwan sir and uh, sendel both of them and along with the entire team uh, uh, dr ravindra dr praj kumar uh, dr jay kumar and the entire team they working uh, Uh, amazingly well and uh, this uh, record i don't know i think we have close to 500 participants for this and uh, they yes. pick up amazing topics the required topics for the current uh, scenario when uh, uh, when it's uh, when uh, influenza is spreading really uh, uh, bizarrely and so wide and um, uh, the fever management in pediatrics by dr nemanathan sir uh, well known and very very close friend and uh, well known faculty and uh, we're looking forward to your uh, uh, what do you call fever secret sir that you would be telling and to the fever management in uh, adults by ragunandan sir uh, who's also professor of medicine from oh, medical yes, yes, college yes. looking forward to both your speeches and congrats to the entire team for organizing this in yes, such sir. a nice way and to the uh, credit points that have been awarded for this uh, program please ensure that all of you uh get your credit points and uh, register yourselves uh, with your register number and your email id and your uh, register up, um your phone number all three needs to be filled up in the chat box so fill that up so that from the state office we'll follow it up and get you the credit points congrats to the entire team and sendal i don't know he's been doing amazing work at the state and the national level as far as the cgp is concerned looking forward to more such programs in the near uh, future and all of us getting our due credit points also thanks to you and thanks to the entire team for getting us that due and a very good topics at the appropriate time thank you congrats and uh, looking forward to the talk thank, thank you and uh, we also oh, we we'll just need really 500 congrats for all your coordination yes okay, sir thank you sir and uh, thanks for your support from the medical council side also to obtain the credit hours mm-hmm. and uh, everything in due time sir thank you so much sir yes sir now i request our uh, நீம் பார்ப்பார் நம்ம பாரு என்ன இமிடியேட் பாஸ் நேஷனல் பிரசிடென்ட் டாக்டர் ஜெயலால் சார் 
current secretary commonwealth medical association to give his felicitations i request all of you to unmute yourselves mute mute all of them to mute all of them should mute yes sir yes sir yes sir sir dalal sir i request jailal sir to give his felicitation mute ponna ma idu no pesa okay Far away. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, because I'm just traveling and just entered in my room. Uh, I'm extremely happy to see the growth and uh, the very good functioning of the IMA CGP. especially the today's meeting in the uh, right time and right way that you are organizing and this is the role which we have envisioned in the uh, role of ima college of general practitioners because our main objective is only academic so whenever there is a new things are happening whenever new issue is coming it is a uh, ima cgp has to come to the forefront and should please Uh, it has been happening since 1963 in our country uh, ever since the ima cgp has formed especially in tamil nadu when uh, since 2007 when the ima cgp headquarters has come to the tamil nadu there is uh, definitely uh, improved vision on the academics are happening whether it is a diabetes hypertension and various other programs but today it is a very important topic which has been discussed and uh, we are fortunate to have two dynamic people dr naminathan and uh, uh, dr raganandan but they are not new to us they are the pillars for us in the academic in pursuit of ima cgp in any event whether it is in the covid time or whether in the infectious disease time both are very par excellent speakers and i am so happy that ima cgp could be able to bring them today and be able to put this here it is also nice to see the ima cgp team is also present and uh, the president and secretary of state is augmenting it Uh, i am sure uh, this this trend will continue because uh, abul is there as a president elect and you will have a very good time so on behalf of the uh, im headquarters and im cgp headquarters i convey my greetings and i'm extremely delighted and i'm happy to see in well functioning so my, my applause to sendil and my beloved beloved and esteemed colleague dr sanguttavan sir for your excellent work you are doing thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you thank you sir thank you sir for thank your you, sir. felicitations you. yes sir uh, sir now i request our dean national cgp headquarters dr ramesh babu sir to give his felicitations sorry for the interruption dr ramesh babu sir is joining a shortly
सर यस सर actually sir will be joining us shortly we will proceed with the cme session sir now i request nemnadan sir to start his session dr nemnadan sir is the coordinator for the infectious disease course who is a consultant pediatrician at kaimtur child rest hospital he did his ug and pg at madurai medical college he is a past vice president of indian academy of pediatrics tnsc thank you start your session sir thank you dr sandil on the outset i like to thank dr kandamil pari sir the dedicated leader of tamil nadu ima you are a great visionary and a role model for all of us sir uh, thank you for bringing this uh, ime cgp course uh, big success and my sincere thanks to dr nnati tyarajan my close friend and my role model once again he is a very dynamic pediatrician and also a very dynamic uh, leader so I, we are really proud to have you as our secretary sir my sincere thanks to dr abul hassan a hard worker and a visionary i am sure he will take ima ima to great heights and my, my sincere thanks to dr jailal sir for joining us and giving his wishes to us thank you sir uh, dr sengutwan and dr sendil kumar Hello, they have been, uh, very much uh, 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 our uh, leaders and pioneers of cgp they have given us yeah, uh, 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 mute yourself please mute yourself host please mute everyone so my sincere thanks to dr sengudwan sendil kumar sir and uh, thanks to dr ramesh babu rabindranath and rajkumar sir with with that i like to start my evidence based lecture on the current fever scenario in children friends this is going to be a very very practical simple for the management strategies for practitioners in the entire tamil nadu so here we have a uh, cocktail of viruses in our country particularly in our state it comes in forms it comes in groups uh, now we have couple of viruses h3n2 h1n1 rsv adenovirus along with your same old dengue throughout the throughout the state so this is probably due to the immune lacune that is present in the entire country that's a reason for these viruses coming to surface let's uh, see what is fever friends you will all agree with me Tem fever is a controlled rise in the body temperature regulated by thermosensitivity cells in hypothalamus the important message is that fever per se is not a disease it is a manifestation of underlying disease so do not chase the fever do not treat the fever you have to treat the cause of fever and i'm sure you will all agree with me fever is a protective mechanism that helps chemotaxis phagocytosis and increases the antibody and reduces the proliferation of microorganisms so a fever is a friend so do not chase the fever so let us use this five point rule to make a diagnosis of whether the given fever 
in our day to day practice is viral or bacterial this is a million dollar question which i am going to tell you in one minute time suppose the child has got previously healthy child gets a sudden onset of high grade fever it's probably viral because incubation period is ultra short if more than one member in the family is having fever at the given time it's probably <laughs> viral because of the ultra short incubation period at the same time if you look at the child eye is red throat is congested nose is watery probably this viral this child has got cough cold water watery stools skin rashes probably multiple system involved dissemination so virus the most important simple thing that you can do is you give paracetamol wait for the child to become active with the child remains remains up and about active during two fevers that's called interfebrile period your diagnosis of viral fever is confirmed so you have to write in your prescription paper short pyrexia nil localizing probably viral without danger signs put your signature name date time and register number this will save you in the court of law this is called a simple five point rule for making a diagnosis of whether it is viral or bacterial if you apply this rule during this epidemics of fever 91% of the time you need not prescribe antibiotics you can manage just with paracetamol and ors this is a very simple rule the specificity and sensitivity of this rule is nearly 99% so having got a rule let's supply it in our day to day practice here you have a 7 year old child who has come with sudden onset of high grade fever sudden severe sore throat dry hacking cough all swinging to us virus the parents ask you whether this child has got s3 and 2 and what will be your answer and how will you proceed this is the question so friends in your consultation room if you see under patients all the under patients are your examiner they will be expecting your practicals viva or say the answer you gave and your written your prescription paper so you have to pass in both your theory and practice so i am going to tell you how to get a 100% success marks yeah 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 because the uh, organizer to mute everyone important la irukku interesting ah irukku mute everyone please mute everyone just one second paarne enna nu paaru please mute everyone yeah so coming to s3 and 2 most of the parents are asking whether this is s3 and 2 or other illnesses the answer to this is very simple please remember s3 and 2 is a non human virus it is a virus found in pig by around 2009 it started entering into human body in 2011 it was first isolated okay s3 n2 is nothing but a flu which is more severe more severe symptoms more severe duration more longer duration more severe in young children and elderly so basically to clinicians like us the important message is whether it is s3 n2 or h1n1 or h5n9 whatever the number is clinical relevance is all the viruses all the flu viruses are the same they have the same sign they have the same symptoms they have the same treatment so do not worry about what is the number of the virus whether it so you have to treat it according to who protocol so i'm going to next few slides i'm going to talk about how you are going to approach a child with flu so if you look at this diagrammatic picture right from head to foot you can have symptoms when you have a child with hacking oh, no. cough high grade fever sore throat and diarrhea clinically you can make a diagnosis just by applying what you have studied in your microbiology you can tell probably it is h1n1 if the child has got sore throat cough and fever with myositis it's probably influenza b if the child has got more of ge symptoms vomiting diarrhea nausea retching it is probably gastric flu just by looking at the symptomatology you can tell what is the virus that's how you can use your knowledge which you have studied in undergraduate to be applied daily in your day to day practice so based on the symptoms you have a mild very simple uh, insignificant illness that is called category a moderate illness is called category b and severe is called category c 
So coming to vast majority, 91% of the flu in our day-to-day -day practice are caused by influenza-like viruses. They are influenza virus, para-influenza virus, adenovirus, rhinovirus, RSV, human metanoma virus, human coronavirus, even your Nipah virus is this virus. So there are seven or eight viruses that cause ILI, influenza-like symptoms. So whatever the virus is, treatment is safe. Sir, kindly unmute, sir. Don't do anything. Just wait and watch. Nature will cure. So, most important message for general practitioners here is do not give IM injection for a child with viral fever. Unfortunately, if the child is in prodrome of polio, your injection will lose the child's limb and also you will lose your practice. Don't satisfy the patients by giving IM injections. That's the most important message. And every child who comes to your clinic should go back with a warning sign, counseling. And you have to insist about the periodic follow-up. That's the most important message in 91% of the viral fever cases that is happening in Tamil Nadu at present. Some children will have chronic diseases of the brain, heart, lungs, liver, kidney, and some of them can have immunosuppressive disease or Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, immunosuppressive diseases or the child is on steroids or if there is an asthma, COPD, diabetes, mellitus, obesity more than BMA more than 40 and children less than 2 years, adults more than 65 years come under comorbid conditions. When they have got comorbid conditions, Automatically, they classify to category B. This will be around 8% of your practice. That is more than 91% category A, no treatment. In this 8% band, they have got severe symptoms with comorbidities. You can start oseltamide without doing tests. This is based on your clinical judgment. In your prescription, you have to write short pyrexia, nil localizing, probably viral, probably flu. Category B, you have to write without danger signs. And you have the most important thing you have to tell is no lab tests. And they should not do lab tests on their own or you should not prescribe lab tests. That's what the government says. And uh, you need to uh, tell the parents not to send the child to school because this one child with flu will spread to the entire school. Whole school will have flu. So most of the time in flu, the vector is small children. They will catch infection from school and bring it to grandparents at home or from the house, they will take it to the school. You have to keep them at home under isolation. That's an important message. Friends, before I go to the next slide, Dr. Sendil has requested me for an uh, inaugural speech by the Dean of CGP. Sendil, please. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Sorry for the interruption, sir. Uh, now I request our Dean, Dr. Ramesh Babu, sir, to give his felicitations. Good evening, all. Time, Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, all of you. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Sandimal Pari, sir, President uh, TNBC at uh, Tamil Nadu uh, State Branch, and Dr. Tagarajan, uh, sir, Secretary, Dr. Uh, Alaga Venkateshan, sir, Treasurer, and immediate past president, Dr. Parani Swami, sir, and Dr. Uh, Abdul Hassan, president elect, and uh, Dr. Jailal, sir, and other uh, Dr. Sengutuman, sir, chairman, CGP, Tamil Nadu State Branch, and Dr. Sedil Kumar, sir, and other uh, renowned uh, persons in the Tamil Nadu State Branch. Good evening to you all. It is my privilege and honor uh, to speak in front of so many eminent and elegant personalities of Telangana and Tamil Nadu State IMA branch. I immensely thank Dr. Sandil uh, sir and uh, Sengutuvan sir for inviting me. I'm very happy to see that uh, the, first talk, the first fellowship course is in infectious disease and infection control. It's really, really very important for primary care physicians. And uh, being I am an expert on HIV medicine, 
and I have been doing since 38 years uh, service, charitable service to HIV AIDS patients as an infectious disease specialist. I know the values and importance of the infectious disease and its control. It is very difficult uh, topic actually. I congratulate the CGP branch of Telangan, Tamil Nadu state for choosing this uh, excellent topic. In future also, I request, uh, request the CGP branch to select innovative topics as we have started the uh, every month CJ, CME uh, conference programs exclusive for primary care physicians. Cardiac emergencies we completed and uh, nephrology, urology we have completed. This month, 26, we are going to complete the gastroenterology emergencies and primary care physicians. One more program on the CGP will be on um, Old Health Day and one more on April. Likewise, every month, uh, we will conduct until December um, more than 12 to 13 programs uh, we have planned. Accordingly, we will go. I request all the Tamil Nadu state branch uh, executives and the CGP faculty kindly extend your support for this program. As of now, we have received around 1,600 registrations from all over India, and we are not charging anything for the conference and no registration fees. And the certificate for CME credit points we are giving from Andhra Pradesh Medical Council. So that will be valid in the entire country in all the, on the state councils. So likewise, the initiation of the Tamil Nadu uh, IMA state branch is uh, excellent. I, I, I've been watching 500 people for this uh, CME. It's a really great thing. I, I sincerely congratulate the CGP team, Tamil Nadu state branch. Sir, please continue. We are there at your support. Whatever support you need from CGP, Headquarters, we are there in person. If you need anything from me, I'm grateful. Once again, I thank all of you for participating in this program and giving me an opportunity to speak with all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now we request our speaker, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your words of wisdom and encouragement. So, next, sir, we have seen flu. 99% of the cases, as I told you, 91% of your flu in your OPD, they do not require any treatment. Uh, without any medicines, nature will cure them. Don't do anything. By doing harm, you will create more problem than good. So 99% do not need much of treatment. Only 1% if they got danger signs, that is they got tachycardia, tachypnea, low O2 saturation, 94. Here in flu, once again, like COVID, pulse oximetry is very useful. You have to educate all the publics who come to you. If they have got a saturation less than 95, they have to bring the child to your hospital. Along with that, hypotension, cyanosis, dehydration, seizures is an indication that this flu child has got category C infection. Category C means you have to do six things at the time. If you have got a clinic, small hospital, refer them to eye center. Admit the child, isolate the child. One hand, you do a test. Another hand, give oseltamivir. You intimate the health authorities. You do everything at the same time. And vast majority of them, nearly 25% of them, develop staphylococcal and strep pneumonia, AIDS, and permanent sepsis. So you need to give third generation cephalosporin. Oseltamivir has to be started immediately, even before the results. So this is what you need to do. All these six at the same time in less than 1% of the cases. So if you see around 100 cases of flu, 99 do not need much of treatment. Only one needs aggressive treatment. That's the important message. So coming to oseltamivir dosage in neonates, particularly less than 14 days, there is no level one evidence to give oseltamivir. Particularly in, the, in these age groups, you can take a picture. So it is 12 milligram, 20 milligram, and 25 milligram, less than one year. After one year, it's based on the weight. So children around one year, less than 15 kilos, it varies from 30 milligrams. It goes up to older children, more than 40 kilos, it is 75 milligrams. You can take a picture of this. So treatment is BD for five days. The same treatment when given as OD for 10 days, it's called chemoprophylaxis. The contacts who, who are known to be contacts of these positive cases, they should receive chemoprophylaxis. That's the important message. So most of the time, 
you will be most important question in your practice is whether this is a common cold or a flu the answer is very simple if the onset is sudden and the fever is very high grade the body pain is severe with myalgia and headache with the less of running nose and stuffy nose sneezing it is flu until proven otherwise all these things in a milder form is common cold common cold definitely does not need any treatment normally for the patients on the funny side you can tell if i treat it will last for 7 days if i don't treat it will last for a week so ultimately everything is same do not treat those patients so the next important question is whether the present available vaccine flu vaccine will give protection against this epidemic h3n2 the answer is very simple yes the present flu vaccine will contain both h3n2 and h1n1 it will it will cover both the present epidemics of or both the influenza viruses you have southern hemisphere vaccine and a northern hemisphere vaccine difference is nothing but the date of commencement of these vaccines recently four days back we got this southern hemisphere vaccine so that is nothing but the vaccine went for countries below the equator since our country tamil nadu is near equator you can take both southern hemisphere vaccine and northern hemisphere vaccine northern hemisphere vaccine is nothing but this is hh and lh sorry nh northern hemisphere sorry for lh okay northern hemisphere vaccine comes in the month of august so our country since it is near equator you can take both southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere in viruses there are two types of virus vaccines one is live attenuated viral vaccine that is nasal spray given about 2 years since it is a live viral it should not be given in pregnancy the vi- vaccine that is given now is called inactivated influenza vaccine it is given as im 0.5 ml above 6 months of age because up to 6 months you have got transplacental flu antibodies from the mother it is safe in pregnancy the dose is same only thing is for children below 9 years of age you have to give two doses for the first time four weeks apart this 2023 quadrivalent vaccine southern hemisphere contains a influenza a sydney five strain h1n1 and darwin h3n2 it also in addition has got austrian flu and the phuket flu so it covers four strains that are prevalent in our country so it has to be taken annually because there is an antigenic drift that happens the viruses are new so the vaccine also will be new and this flu vaccine can be given with along other vaccines like dpt or typhoid hepatitis c chicken pox it can be given with any other vaccine and please remember sometimes you can see patients with allergy in those patients you have to give the vaccine with caution that means i mean you need to take adrenaline hydrocortisone oxygen on your table and then give the vaccine that's a simple precaution another type of presentation in the current scenario is a child coming with high fever watery diarrhea conjunctivitis and painful frequent reddish urination combination of four systems at the given child so what is this this is another virus previously i'm sure you must have seen in west bengal about this virus this is nothing but adeno virus so adeno virus outbreak is happening throughout tamil nadu so whenever you have a child with conjunctivitis high fever cough and diarrhea with passing a reddish urination or a painful urination yeah. that is adeno virus until proven otherwise these children do not need antibiotics just symptomatic treatment is sufficient if you do a urine microscopy pusels will be there more than 10 pusels but culture will be negative that's called sterile pyuria so no treatment for uti no treatment for cefixin and the important message is secondary bacterial infection is flu is high whereas in adeno is very very uncommon so don't start antibiotics by just by looking at the x-ray picture showing a low bar pneumonia even in adeno virus you can have low bar pneumonia like picture so you do not rely upon single crp to start antibiotic that should be rising crp to start antibiotics if there is a keratitis you have to refer to ophthalmologist there is a immunocompromised child you have to refer to is center the drug of choice in a severe adeno virus that is when there is hypoxia less than 94 when you use hfno is sidafovir it's a costly drug cost around 45000 rupees but highly nephrotoxic better not to use in children safer is ivig 
though the vaccine is available it is not available for public it is only for military use so now i am telling post covid we got lots of immune deficiency that's called immune lacune many viruses have come now adenovirus outbreak is happening so next a few months we'll be having lots of fungal sepsis you will have hyperlucent lungs you can have chronic lung disease copd asthma so next uh, cgp meeting probably will be discussing about post adenovirus complications so let's see another third type of presentation that has been going on in our country in our state for many years it is nothing but high fever chills 103 retro orbital headache severe body pain child is not able to walk that is something multiple fractures that has happened in the child that is called break bone fever or otherwise it's a dengue sometimes they can have a evanescent pink evanescent rash throughout the body with a combo of this in this dengue season please keep dengue in the back of the mind particularly if the child has got abdominal pain make the child lie down put your hand on the right hypochondrium see for tender hepatomegaly if it is there it is dengue until proven otherwise so such a situation the difficult portion what we see in our practitioners practitioners sitting inside a 10 by 10 room most of the parents sit down over head ask for immediate cue because the child is having exam so they want fast cue and they also want to know the diagnosis on day one by doing some lab tests what will be our answer for three questions the answer is very simple you have to think before you ink the most important thing is use only paracetamol the best co prescription is who reduce ors for children please remember this four no no antibiotic no steroid no nsaid no im injection no test on day one if you do cbc cbc will be normal but the child will be abnormal if at all you want to do only one test it is urine microscopy or you can you use a urine dipstick okay. and please remember what the parents need is counseling about danger signs not your prescription never give aspirin or ibuprofen or mefenamic acid to reduce fever because they all have anti platelet action the children has increased 33% increase in the bleeding manifestation please you must all know the most important part of prescription is counseling and sometimes if you fail to recognize danger signs particularly in dengue the mortality is 25% whereas if you educate the public you can reduce the mortality to zero so i want our country india to be dengue mortality zero mortality country just by educating the public without investment i want that i want the central government and state government to take care of this educating public if the all the public that comes to our hospital know what one warning signs you can save all the 100% of the dengue cases i said no test but what can be done sitting in your clinic inside a primary health center or a small chamber in a village just by using your bp apparatus during a dengue season you can diagnose without blood test this is called tonicot test you tie the bp cup one third of the size of the arm in a child and then raise it between diastolic and systolic keep it for 5 minutes and release it over one minute slowly at the end of 5th minute if there is a more than 10 particle in one square inch it is probably dengue until proven otherwise the sensitivity specificity is very good after 2 days it is nearly 95% so sometimes we do see children who are coming to us on fourth day fever was there for 3 days now the fever has gone now the child we did a lab test on our own platelet count is normal dengue count test is negative i am a working parent i cannot admit the child please give iv fluids in your op this is what we see in our day to day practice the most important message here is you see these red lines day 4 is a day in which these children will going for complications and no fever means the child is entering into a febrile phase this child will going for shock and already the child is dull sleepy abdominal pain reduced urination cold feet all are indication for admission the pcb is 42 normal hemoglobin told me it's into 3 it should be 36 it's 42 already hemo concentration is there there is seepage of fluid from the intravascular compartment to extravascular compartment so this child is already in going for leaky phase please remember dengue is not a platelet disease you can have a sick dengue with a normal platelet count do not look at the platelet count 
and dengue cohort test should not be done because it has got false positivity and false negativity and please remember dengue is a continuous disease you cannot give morning and evening fluids because it fluids has to be given 24 hours continuously this slide is a very very important slide that tells you about the warning signs six warning signs you have to educate every public who comes to you you have to write in tamil kolanda nai nai alugada thongite irukuda kai kal la jillu irukuda white roll irukuda urine kammiya poda odamla saapu pulli irukuda ratha kasivu vaandi karupu kalala varuda kaapi kalala varuda motion karupa poda idella eludi tamil la eludi unga consultation table la ottirunga ask everyone to take a picture of this and come back if there is warning signs even in the absence of fever the message is the complications of dengue can arise 24 to 48 hours after the disappearance of fever if we don't tell this point the moment fever disappears they will they will not come back to you you have to tell them the complication will arise after the disappearance of fever it's a very very important slide important message i want all the 500 doctors who are attending this meeting to write in tamil to make everyone to read this take a picture of this and come back even in the absence of fever that's the most important thing so coming to the test i as i already told you first three days you can do ns1 elisa from second day you can do a tonic test ideal gold standard is fifth day igm igg elisa from third day to fifth day all tests will be negative between do this time three to fifth day don't do any test and never do car test that's important message from the government of india world health organization so in a such a child you admit the child what will be your protocol the ideal fluid is normal saline and avoid dextrose containing fluid if you are using still using dextrose normal saline please stop it from today because these children will going for neuroendocrine stress phenomenon they will develop cerebral edema seizures and death so never use dextrose containing fluid in dengue never use isolate p so this is a simple protocol you can take a picture of this suppose if you want all the slides at the end of the meeting in my last slide i have given my given my cell number you please note it down and then you can send a message to me i'll send you all the protocols for the efficient 100% successful management of dengue in children so the ideal fluid is normal saline you have to give it 10 ml per kg weight before starting fluid take a hematocrit monitor the vital urine output hematocrit periodically if the child gradually improves within 48 to 72 hours gradually reduce fluid from 10 ml to 7 ml 5 ml 3 ml 2 ml 1 ml and go to oral fluids as early as possible suppose in case the child doesn't improve with first bolus you have to give second bolus after second bolus with a bp or the shock is not getting corrected you have to refer them to any hospital where they have got pacu if the hematocrit drops more than 20% that means there is a ongoing bleeding that's called occult bleeding you need to give pacta bc if the hematocrit suddenly rises more than 20% there is a ongoing severe leak the child is going for shock you need to give colloid this protocol i think you have to take a picture and stick it in your consultation table you have to use it daily for every dengue fever If you use this simple protocol, you can save almost 100% of the children. Five things you need to monitor. Number one is hematocrit, as I told you. Second is urine output. And the third is a pulse pressure, difference between systolic and diastolic. If the difference is less than 20, you need to refer. Fourth is heart rate. Very, very important. If there is an undue rise in the heart rate, normal heart rate rise is for a one degree Celsius rise, there will be 10 beat rise. Whereas if you have a more than 10 beats, tachycardia, undue tachycardia, there is a bleeding. And respite rate is very, very important, particularly during recovery phase. If there is a sudden increase in respite rate, immediately stop IV fluids. That means child is gone to recovery phase. That's an important thing. So this is a euro meter, euro bag that costs around 100 rupees. for research for setting people who are practicing in small hospitals small villages where they don't have lab technician in the middle of the night you can use this connect this to the child's urine urinary passage and monitor the urine output the ideal is 1 ml per kg per hour 
for a 10 kilo child it should pass 60 ml in 6 hours this is a four man cvp you can buy this one and start using from tomorrow same child suddenly there is an increase in hematocrit and a sudden drop in the urine output that means this child is going for shock then child is going for capillary leak so the important message here is these children will need normal saline bolus immediately and the increase is very high more than 20 percent you need to start colloids immediately the colloids which we use commonly is ffp if we don't have blood bank you can start starch preparation normally inotropes for general practitioners it's not recommended for pediatricians for hospitals where you have pacu you can use this protocol generally inotropes are rarely needed in dengue so if this child has a sudden drop in hematocrit with undue tachycardia as i told you earlier it is um, under occult bleeding you need to start pack the bc and the most important message is do not give prophylactic platelet transfusion the latest who guideline says do not give prophylactic platelet transfusion that's a very very important message so you must know what are the subtle signs of recovery this child has a if you look at the white island the sea of redness this is the first sign of recovery in young children the whole body will be red and these children will have start coming out of the critical phase as early as you see this simple sign island of white sea of redness itching and plantar region palmar region is another important sign which will give importance disappearance of abdominal pain reversal of appetite will give you clinical clue that this child has come to recovery phase once you know that the child has come to recovery phase you can take a picture of this you have to immediately stop iv fluids iv fluids narrow therapeutic index you should not give more than 72 hours so if you continue iv fluids in recovery phase you land up in hydrogenic pulmonary edema. Many of the deaths in our country is due to hydrogenic pulmonary edema. Please never continue IV fluids. Once a child's hematocrit normalizes, once the urine output becomes more than 2 ml per kg, once all the signs of leak stops. So discharge criteria is very simple. If this child achieves these findings, you can send them home. This is a very, very simple discharge criteria. And the most important message is platelet count is not an indicator for admission and platelet count is not an indicator for discharge. If the child clinically improves with hematological improvement, hemodynamic stability, even with the platelet count of 50,000, you can send them home. That's an important message from the WHO guidelines. So this is a very, very important slide for practitioners who are pr practicing in periphery. If you have a dengue child in your clinic, if the child has got all these six findings, please refer them as early as possible. Expanded dengue syndrome is nothing but child who has got a severe dengue, but does not have shock or bleeding, but they can have seizures, they can have renal failure. All those things are called expanded dengue syndrome. Child with shock, hypotension, elevated liver enzymes, major bleed, fluid overload, hemophagocytic HLH syndrome, you refer them as early as possible. So, this is one of the common situations which we face now in the current scenario. Child coming with persistent cough, cough more than a week, more than two weeks, following viral fever. How will you approach? Approach is very simple. As per Nelson textbook of medicine, avoid cough syrup in children less than two years. Number one, do not use polypharmacy. I find lots of cough syrup that contains cough suppressant, bronchodilator, antihistamine, mucolytic, all having opposite action put in a single bottle, nothing will lack. Do not use polypharmacy. Always give single ingredient cough syrup. I'll tell you which condition, what medicine. If the child, you got a young child, has got a common cold, stuffy nose, sneezing, walk nose, give first generation antihistamine. It is diphenhydramine. The dose is 5 mg per kg per day, given 6 hourly. It will relieve it. Relieve not only the symptoms, the irritability cry, since it's a first generation, it crosses blood-brain barrier and gives a mild sedation also. 
The parents will be happy, child will be happy. If there is an isolated dry cough without any other lung signs, you can use dextromethorphone. Do not use codeine. And if there is an allergic rhinitis, post nasal dripping in a school going child, you have to use second generation cephalosporin like desloratadine, fexofenadine, or levocetrazine because these drugs do not cross blood brain barrier, they do not cause sedation, they will not have scholastic performance involvement. If the child has got chronic persistent hair febrile nocturnal dry cough with a family history of bees or the family history of atopy in the given child or eczema, flexural eczema, give short acting beta 2 agonist. When you give, before you give salbutamol, what you can do is in a child with a chronic hair febrile cough, you can give a nebulizer of salbutamol and see. This is called therapeutic test. If the cough comes down immediately after salbutamol nebulizer, this child will benefit out of salbutamol syrup. Just give simple salbutamol syrup. Don't give mixture of mucolytics and geofenicin, bronchodilators, other than other combination. Okay. So if the this is the only indication for pres prescribing antibiotic in a cough, particularly when they've got chronic wet cough, this is called protracted bacterial bronchitis. The cough more than weeks, you have got a and secretion that is coming out. Wherein you can use amoxicillin with clomelic acid. Otherwise, most of the cough do not require antibiotics. For cough, do not take X-ray chest. <laughs> because cough is a receptor, cough receptor trigger in the bronchial lumen. So when you take X-ray chest, it will be normal. Honestly, you are irradiating, irradiating the child. So if you think of pneumonia, if there is a tachypnea, if there is a grunt, you can take for interstitial pathology, you can take XHS. For cough, do not take XHS. And most of the cough are viral, do not give antibiotics. So what about honey? Some educated parents will ask you, you it has got a good demulsion effect, it has got antioxidant effect, it has got a cytokine release, and it has got a safety profile recommended by WHO. For children above the age of one year, you can give pasteurized honey for the fear of odorism. And the dose is 2.5 to 5 ml with a little warm water. So for considering the dengue, please remember dengue is not a platelet disease. You need to monitor the patient from today. Do not monitor the platelet. You can have a normal child with a child with low platelet count. And you can have a very sick child with a normal platelet count. And also drop in platelet count, you must know, does not have any clinical significance. If you know the reason for platelet count drop, you'll stop prescribing drugs to improve platelet count. Please remember the molecule, the, the platelet and the dengue virus have got the molecular mimicry. Both of them look similar. Whenever our body produces IgM antibody, these antibodies which are supposed to destroy dengue cells, since the platelet has got same molecular pattern, it destroys our own platelets like ITP. So when there is a thrombocyte DPR, that means there is lots of IgM antibody in our body. So there is no clinical relevance for thrombocytopenia. Do not treat thrombocytopenia. So this is a simple rule. Please take a picture of this. You can manage almost 100% of the pediatric cases without medicines and 91% do not need antibiotics. 9% you can prescribe antibodies based applying this three-point rule. Any supra-diaphragmatic infection is gram-positive infection, use amoxicillin. Implant diaphragmatic infection, gut and urinary tract, use cefixim. Skin and soft tissue, use cephalexin and first generation cephalosporin, cephadroxin. Only three antibiotics in pediatrics. And the most important carry-home message for all doctors, wash your hands in between two patients. If not, you can sanitize using a sanitizer. Do not take your hands to the face because your hands act as a carrier. And avoid handshakes. And please do not touch inanimate subjects, particularly handrails when you're going for rounds. Get vaccinated immediately. I've been taking this vaccine for the past 28 years. I have not got a single flu for the past many years. So the best and cheap roundtable strategy for you and the, for the public is wear a mask. If you are in ICU, wear N95 mask. 
you need, if you are an op you can wear a normal three layered mask for the public they are going out even it's enough they wear a normal cotton mask so in flu simple slide 91% mild no test no acetamivir 8% moderate no test give acetamivir 1% test treat admit isolate intimate the most important message is you have to educate the public to use pulse oximetry and uh, to come if the oxygen saturation is less than 95 education is most important thing particularly in s3 and 2 so coming to the last slide so you should not treat the fever please treat the cause of fever do not please unmute everyone i to mute yeah the kind of unmute thank yeah. you no cbc on day one and please remember the only thing the parents wants is counseling about danger signs and the need for daily review you have to tell them even in the absence of fever if there is a danger sign they have to come back and the best co prescription is ors and the simple tool in the management is io chart and uh, abdominal pain if you get any child in the presence of abdominal pain at the time of absence of fever is the finding in plasma leakage this child needs hospitalization do not prescribe any ranitidine or any other drug like antacid gel don't send them away you have to catch them and keep them inside particularly if they have got a tender hepatomegaly avoid all these four and most important message what the government wants to tell is there should be no self medication or no self test this is a very very important message to all the doctors you have to convey to all the patients sometimes you can have rt pcr positive during covid time we had lots of covid child was sick we thought it was covid but it actually it was dengue that was the culprit this covid was sitting there in the nose not causing any disease it's a simple bystander even now we got one child with h1n1 the child has got severe dengue h1n1 is not the culprit so do not rely upon your lab test go give importance to clinical examination iv fluids don't give beyond 72 hours avoid bd iv fluids you have to give only ors don't give commercial drinks like fanta limca all those things in your inpatient you have to monitor every hourly ask the sister to do monitor every hourly as i told you please remember from today forget platelets focus patients that's an important message okay you have to do simple triage for all children with fever you have to use your receptionist to see the color of the child see whether the extremities is cold see the temperature volume of the pulse respiratory rate if uh, five any one is abnormal the child has to be rushed inside your clinic immediately if you look at the child take care of the child you can reduce fever mortality to zero so triage is very very important that you need to start from today so informing our author health authority is another important thing which we should all do and uh, the last important point is simple protocol that will save life is if you got sim clinic if there is danger sign refer if you got small hospital if there is a severe disease refer just by referring you can save your practice and also save your patients with that i like to thank you and thank once again the ima and the ima cgp giving is giving me this opportunity please take down my number 98422 Triple one seven nine, friends. There are more than five hundred people attending this CME. I want all of you to register for infectious disease certificate course that is started by IMA CGP. This course will be very useful. This is tailor made to your needs in your clinics and hospitals. This is headed by the former director of public health, Dr. Kolinde Sami, and also by Dr. Raghunandan, the medical. Director of uh, Rajiv Gandhi Government Medical College, Chennai, and he is a nodal person of the COVID Tamil Nadu government. And we have got eminent persons like Dr. Mohan Kumar for, from CDC and Dr. Suri Kumar, microbiology professor, along with me. Five of us are going to take this course. Those who attended this meeting, please uh, contact me or Dr. Sindhil, secretary, immediately and get registered for the. infectious disease certificate course that will change your science practice scientifically and successfully thank you thank you for the opportunity after dr raghunandan speech 
we'll both of us will answer your questions if there are any questions you can put it in the chat box if you want the slides you can send a request to me in my phone number i already told you i'll send you the slides with that thank you everyone yeah. thank you sir name na sir thank you thank you thank you name na sir thank you sir thank you sir yeah, thank you sir Sir, shall we have a QA session now, sir, Thank or you, end of sir. the session, sir? Sir, uh, questions sir. at the end of the meeting, sir. Oh, fine, sir. Done, sir. Done, sir. We will proceed, sir. So now I request our uh, next speaker, Dr. Professor S. Raghunathan, sir, to start his uh, session. So, sir has finished his MBBS in Madras Medical College, MD in, again in uh, Madras Medical College. And uh, sir is currently Professor of Medicine, Institute of Inter Internal Medicine, Madras Medical College. Chief Physician, INCU and Toxicology Unit, Voice and Control Training and Research Center, Rajiv Gandhi General Hospital. Additional responsibilities, State Nodal Officer for Poison Management, Government of Tamil Nadu, Medical Officer in Charge, ART Clinic, and so on. So, I request that to continue with this session. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Sir. Sir, my technical best friend, sir. Am I audible, sir, now? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Yes, proceed. Slides are visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Thank you. Sir, just now, uh, just um, unmute yourself for a second, sir. Yes, sir. Now, I just muted all. You can just unmute ah, one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Done, sir. Yeah. Good evening, Thank sir. You. Good evening, good evening, all. Uh, respected uh, State President, Dr. Pari, sir. Dr. Tyagarajan, Dr. Jailal, Dr. Parni Swami, Dr. Sanjeev Kuvan, and Dr. Tandir Kumar, and uh, senior, senior faculty members of the Parliament. Sir, just unmute it again, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just unmute it again, sir. There are some disturbance. So I have muted all. Yes, sir. So, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, my good friend, Dr. Piriya Pishan, sir, from Kaimutu, and my uh, fellow IMA members and friends, sir. First of all, I thank the IMA uh, State Branch of College of General Practitioners for organizing this meeting. And I am really thrilled to see around 500 IMA members are actively participating uh, in this program. So that shows the unity of IMA also. So from the, <clears throat> uh, our, our pediatrician sir, Dr. Neminadan has done a very good presentation. So I just take the lead from where he left. Um, so actually you, after listening to Dr. Neminadan's presentation, he touched on four important topics of acute febrile illness that is relevant in today's context or maybe in the current uh, um, few months to come. So I think he touched mostly on one that is on dengue again, which is a continuous issue in our state, number one. Next, he touched about the influenza again with the emerging the new variant of H3N2, he touched it. Then he touched upon the other common respiratory or other <coughs> uh, viral infections. So I'll just take a lead from there. Just a minute. So before we just before we go to the individual diseases, <clears throat> some of the points which Chair, Sir has already mentioned, I'll just try to reiterate that. Definition of again, WHO talks about AFI. Again, I still remember before and I used to write for A fever, PUO, PU. I think now the terminology is very clear what we call it as AFI. So AFI has got a definite definite definition as per the WHO criteria. Any febrile illness of two to seven days duration with two or more of the following manifestations like headache, pitro-orbital pain, myalgia, arthralgia, and bash. And of course, they can have some hemorrhagic manifestations also. So if two or more, again, Sarah has already mentioned about this. Most of them are self-limiting and they are viral in nature. Meticulous history. I think this is the area as uh, uh, family physicians we have to focus since I work in a tertiary care hospital and uh, seeing me working in an intensive care unit, 
when we see a patients with uh, some infections going for a multi organ dysfunction and landing with uh, critical illness when we go back into the history of the patient i feel that most some of the phys- some of the family physicians have not done a meticulous history number one another error what we find is follow up of these patients so as we discuss the clinical scenarios i'll try to reiterate this point but again i want to reinforce that meticulous history and clinical examination in fact when you are reviewing a patient of acute febrile illness today again when he comes back tomorrow don't assume that yesterday itself i have done the general examination i have looked for jaundice skin so today i will go for something no every day if a few patient are following up every day you see the patient as if you are seeing for the first time this we have done repeatedly because the rash which was not there before would have appeared today the eschar of scrub typhus which was not there or which you would have missed yesterday you would have picked up today similarly the capillary filling tends so like that we can keep on adding that so the request is see the patient every day as if you are seeing for the first time okay about the investigation sir has already mentioned about the need for investigation only in certain situations that also we we'll try to reiterate in most of our acute febrile afi patients they need only symptomatic and supportive care which is more sufficient and again as i said follow up is very essential again these are the normal things just i'll try to skip this again these are various types of again sir has put it in a different format friend or a form i put it good or bad it's always the elevation of body temperature is good as it shows the fighting system of the individual again we have to keep in mind that fever pattern has got so many influencing factors especially patient would have taken the antipyretics just before your consultation or somebody would have or he the patient himself would have started steroids again in aging i think uh, fever is not a very common manifestations of um, uh, infection in old age today morning also we did a symposium in our institution on s3n2 and again the literature says one of the common manifestation of h3n2 in old people is extreme tiredness and loss of appetite they may not even have a fever so that's what fever may not be always there in any infection always again the patient may be on a immuno suppressed states also so sir has already mentioned about all the common things so i will just try to take few of this considering the time constraint so again sir uh, already i was listening to the entire talk of dr neminathan he has touched so many critical points on the management of dengue so i'll just try to fill up some more that we come across in adult practice sir was focusing on pediatric practice of course most of them apply to adult also but in few areas that i'll try to highlight first is for example this is a master chart of uh, uh dengue i think i'm sure most of the doctors who are attending this program would have seen this many times but i'll just try to take few cues from this thing then if a acute febrile illness comes to any day, when will you suspect dengue see that is the first question not every case that comes with fever need not be dengue or the common question that arises is when should i suspect clinically so i'll give you few clues when should you suspect clinically number 1 Let's look at the temperature. That the maximum temperature is on day one, maybe on day two. So the patient says, "Nete varko nalla arna sir, ni kaal elendi mudiyile. Kolutte the jorong kolutte the, the nalla mudiyile. Eraado pannenga sir. I think the each word which he uses takes makes a very good meaning out of it. Sudden onset of fever more than one or two. Number one. Number two. Tiredness, fatigability, and lethargy. this is a very very important warning symptom in dengue in fact the patients who we treat no for dengue usually they are otherwise healthy adults a 20 year old boy comes to my clinic he says enal mudila sir edal panninga sir we don't expect a 20 year old boy to say like this within a day of day or one or two of fever so that is a the clue at clinical uh, level number 1 again just look at the temperature chart number third or fourth day the temperature touches normal especially in children as sir was mentioning so when the fever is there the parents the mother is worried why the fever is continuous again i will tell you to our dear friends please tell the if you are suspecting a viral fever 
especially in a dengue like scenario please tell the mother or the patient that it will take 3 to 4 days for the fever to settle if you give antipyretics it will set so maybe you have to continue the anti antipyretics for 3 or 4 days because sometimes or many times our our, our patients expect a cure in one day or two days that may not occur in dengue so it has to have a natural history of the disease so it takes around 3 to 4 days of the 4 uh, days to settle but another twist in this scenario is when the fever is there patients are worried when the fever touches normal we have to be more alert we have to be more vigilant because this is a phase of complications not everybody with dengue is going to go for complication definitely we can say at least around 5 or 7% may go for complications but who is that 5 or 7 it's very very difficult to predict unless we have a follow up and monitoring okay then comes to dehydration again sir was mentioning about the best way of hydrating a patient is oral 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 if the child or the patient is not able to tolerate because of vomiting diarrhea tiredness or drowsiness then you can think of starting a saline otherwise still ors or rice kanji in fact the dps sir will say rice kanji is the best hydrating fluid that we can give to a patient so again i want you to remember this points why that fluid management is very critical in dengue i'll tell you five reasons why fluid loss occurs in dengue number 1 high fever yes vomiting yes diarrhea yes plasma leak yes child or adult is not taking adequate fluids so all these things uh, trigger dehydration so make sure patient is hydrated okay now we'll come to the, the most critical part of this illness is on the <coughs> complications which we expect around fourth or fifth day of the illness so the two complications that commonly we come across is one is plasma leak what we call it as a third space loss so where are the areas where you have to clinically look for number one periorbital edema for fines of the face periorbital edema is another area of uh, capillary leak of course in adults most commonly we say we see one is pleural effusion and other is ascites so this is where when to use judiciously certain investigation personally from my own experience i would say if the patient is sick if the patient is becoming breathless please do ultrasound because it will give you two three important findings to confirm our clinical suspicion one whether the patient has got a free fluid in the abdomen in the form of ascites two as he got a pleural effusion three as he got a gall bladder wall edema or thickening so if i see a afi patient with any one of these findings clinically i know i am dealing with dengue so that is where use of ultrasound in certain situations will help us in early diagnosis coming back to the so first is dehydration next is shock in the form of plasma leak the final assault that occurs in a clinical patient in a patient of dengue is the bleed in adults the most common bleed we come across is gi gastrointestinal bleeds in the form of hematemesis and melina again i want to alert our friends that don't think that patient will lose 1 liter 2 liter of uh, blood to go to shock even if he loses 200 to 300 ml he may develop for a shock many of us may asking why because already is dehydrated not corrected already plasma has leak again that plasma leak is not appreciated externally because it's third space all the plasma is going only inside from the intravascular to the extravascular space so the patient not the doctor would have assessed so even a 200 of 300 ml of blood loss tilts a patient from a compensated shock to a decompensated shock so that is where the uh, clinically early recognition of symptoms and signs is very very crucial in dengue i'm i'm very very important to say if the patient slips into a organ impairment what we call it as a multi organ dysfunction syndrome i always tell my post graduates that if you are going to say dengue with multi organ dysfunction it's a good diagnosis to write but very very bad for the patient to recover again the literature says if the patient slips into a multi organ dysfunction even in the best setup the mortality is more than 90% so that is where at the primary care level 
we have to pick up these people and treat them early with fluids or recognize the plasma leak and treat appropriately. We don't want any patients to be referred with. That's what Dr. Neminathan said was repeatedly telling the warning symptoms and signs. Again, to revise whatever he said, to add some more points to that, when to refer or when to know the patient is going for a problem in dengue. Number one, warning symptoms and signs. Number one, extreme tiredness, fatigability, and lethargy. Then they say persistent vomiting. What we mean by persistent? More than three times per day. If the patient has not passed urine for more than six hours, more than 12 hours he has not passed urine. Sarah has also mentioned urine output is poor and CVP. Please, in fact, we can say dengue shock, we call them as walking shock. A patient in shock even will walk into a clinic. Nobody will think he is in shock. Sir was mentioning about the tourniquetes. Even simple that is the capillary filling time. If the capillary filling time is more than five seconds. Another important bedside parameter, narrowing of pulse pressure. Today BP it is 120-80. Morning, evening it is 110-80. Still 30. Tomorrow morning it is 90 by 70. So 20. So what was the pulse pressure 24 hours back? 40, now it has become 20. So this is where we believe in close monitoring, continuous monitoring and correct monitoring. So warning symptoms and signs, narrowing of pulse pressure. Again, transaminitis. If you do the liver enzymes, they can go for a transaminitis. Already I mentioned about plasma leak and other things and hemorrhage. So all these are early, we have to pick up so that they don't go for mods. Again, Sar mentioned about fluid overload. Again, especially in pediatric practice, do not continue to give or push IV fluids for more than 48, maximum 72, because the leaked plasma may re-enter the circulation. Your IV fluid will add to the floor, so patient will go for a pulmonary edema. So this is where, from our previous experience, we'll say some of the people we lost because of fluid overload. Okay, so that is the, as far as the clinical potential issues, their recognition and how to uh, pick up and how to manage. And coming to lab, again, Sad has repeatedly told about it's not a platelet deficiency disease. In fact, I would say in dengue, it is not only quantitative defects, it is qualitative defects also. So don't worry too much on platelets. Again, hematocrit is a very, very sensitive indicator. So if the plate, if the hematocrit raises more than 20% uh, of your baseline, more than 20% of your baseline, again, that shows hemoconcentration, again, hemoconcentration because of dehydration. Again, Sarah has mentioned about NS1 antigen and IgM and IgG. So again, I strongly believe all the experience tells us dengue is a clinical diagnosis. Dengue is a clinical, don't, all these things will support just because you are going to get IgM positive, your treatment is not going to change. Because all of us know we do not have antiviral drug. Only thing, as I said, it's a clinical diagnosis from epidemiological, from public health point of view, it may help. Anyway, just for the benefit of the doctors, I'll tell you how long this IgM will persist. IgM will persist for three months. So even if somebody has recovered from dengue, I'm just putting a clinical scenario. Last uh, two weeks back, Two weeks back, patient had a dengue infection, say in Hero. He was positive. He has recovered completely. Now he has come to Chennai for his job. He's working I'm here. I'm after 40 I'm days, I'm after 40 I'm days, he again develops, I'm for example, typhoid. Now, I'm getting I happening. Hey, Sir, can you mute? Sir, 
somebody is somebody has unmuted madam can you please mute can you mute yourself there are the people who are talking to you all are talking to you all are talking to you all are talking to you Hello, madam. Doctor Sandhya, can you mute the video? Madam, 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 so we are we are just looking at the igm so if the patient comes to chennai and he gets enteric fever positive and also maybe incidentally igm may be positive because i said it persists for three months so that is where whenever you are interpreting any blood report please do not interpret in isolation please correlate with the clinical scenario with the history that's what when i started the presentation i told that history is going to be whether he had any recent infection of other fevers also that also should be considered so um, uh, so what dr uh, devinathan said i'm just trying to add some more points as far as dengue is concerned maybe if there's any more questions we'll take it up in the end so we'll move to the Sir, we are not not able to hear you, sir. You need to unmute yourself, sir. Sir, can you unmute, sir? Now we are able to see the screen. Can you unmute, sir? Sir, can you unmute, sir? Am I audible now, sir? Ah, yes, yes, sir. Now, sir. now it's sir. audible, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Maybe, no, I had some problem two. in changing my slide. Okay. Okay. I think sir. after right. I think uh, after uh, uh, looking at the dengue on some critical points, I think still as far as uh, influenza is concerned or a uh, uh, respiratory infection is concerned, uh, I think we have to be, we have to be very careful in defining the illness. So WHO has come has come out two important definitions even from the public. health point of view one is we call it as il like influenza like illness where the patient has a fever of 38 degrees celsius or more and cold common cold fever i mean cough and patient may have tiredness and fatigability and this is called il like influenza like illness if the patient requires admission for example for whatever reason in the form of increased tachypnea or hypotension or patient is having the saturation is falling something like that ili needing admission which becomes sari that is sari stands for severe acute respiratory infection so all the uh, friends should be very clear what is ili and what is sari and we have to follow that again as far as covid is concerned i think for the last two years we had a many many workshops on Uh, covid and our own experience has also taught many things so for want of time i'll just highlight only two or three points in uh, covid because it's a long disease where we know the early phase is the early infection where the patient will have only constitutional symptoms fever diarrhea and headache again most of our viral fevers including dengue will present initially as vomiting and diarrhea see this is where sometimes when the patient presents only with fever and diarrhea many of naturally we diagnose as acute gastroenteritis and third or fourth day they develop respiratory symptoms so we have to follow most of these viral fevers whether they are becoming totally all right or they are developing new symptoms like respiratory symptoms that we have to keep it in mind especially in h1n1 this has happened many times that's what i wanted to stress that 
Again, the second phase is the most uh, uh, immune response phase is the pulmonary phase. We, we have already seen the various types of COVID pneumonias and we, are, we know the monitoring criteria of category A, B, C and all that has already highlighted also for H1N1. So I'm not going into the deep, but what we have to understand is we have to deal with a lot of post-COVID recovered patients, what we call it as long COVID and especially use of steroids. I think the COVID has taught us usually for many infections, we say don't use steroids, but from our experience and uh, definitely evidence-based medicine, we know people who require oxygen in COVID, definitely there is a role of steroids that we also, we have to keep it in mind. And uh, of course the long COVID or the uh, thrombotic, thrombotic COVID in the form of uh, stroke or acute MI, all these things I think our doctors have experienced or even still experienced. So still experiencing. So what I request is routinely we ask, no, sugar, BP, I think in our practice, you should regularly ask, did you suffer from COVID? Were you hospitalized for COVID? Whether you have vaccinated for COVID? I think these three significant past history also in times to come is going to be part of our past history evaluation. So that's the only thing I wanted to tell as far as uh, um, COVID is concerned. Again, still, Two days, uh, two days back, uh, Times of India has come out with the report that uh, COVID, uh, influenza, and uh, our uh, H3N2 is going to coming together or more, all the three are together, plus H1N1 and H3N2 and uh, your uh, COVID, they can be together also. So again, WHO also endorsed that view. So. We have also handled COVID and dengue combinations also during our previous thing. So still COVID is not gone. So we may see some uh, surge in the cases. Yeah, so, so next come again, as sad as one, one area with the doctor, I mean, the name in other has not touched is on the leptospirosis. Even though this is not a, usually we say following a rainfall, we get that. But definitely leptospirosis also should be kept in a differential diagnosis of acute febrile illness. So I'll just give you a few criteria. One, maybe following an incidental rainfall, number one. Most important is fever with myalgia. In dengue, you get fever with arthralgia. But here in uh, lepto, you get fever with myalgia. Another thing is subconjunctival hemorrhage with jaundice plus or minus. And they can have a conjunctival suffusion, conjunctival hemorrhage, and maybe history of any animal contacts. And they can have some uh, muscle pain and uh, meningitis like pictures. And urinary complications is well known in the form of albuminuria and acute kidney injury. Again, we have seen leptospirosis patient coming with massive bleed also in the form of GI bleed. Again, in dengue, I forgot to mention about menorrhagia. Especially in menstruating women, AFI, please ask for menorrhagia, which many of our patients may not reveal. They may think it's part of this normal menstrual cycle. So like that in leptospirosis also, one of the challenging complication is a bleed in the form of GI bleed, hematuria. Again, hematuria is a very common feature. So acute febrile illness with jaundice, with muscle pain, with subconjunctural hemorrhage points towards Leptospirosis, of course, we have a drug called doxycycline, which is very, very effective against uh, 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 leptospirosis. Of course, if it is not there in pregnancy and children, we may not be able to use. We can use azithromycin or third generation cephalosporin. So these are, the, of course, we do a MSAT test for uh, confirmation of uh, uh, leptospirosis, or we do a dark field microscopy where it is uh, actively mobile, uh, spirochete, just like our syphilis, our lepto is also a spirochete. Again, this is a very, very easily treatable disease and with, as I said, doxy or your azithromycin. Then I'll come to just focus on malaria because still, as I was mentioning, we should not lose a single life due to dengue or for that matter, we should not lose a life of any one of the treatable acute infections is malaria, especially falciparum. High mortality, especially if it is not recognized early and treated, and especially in pregnancy. In pregnancy with malaria, the mortality is very high. So I'll not go into the 
uh, clinical features, all of you, I'm sure you are well versed. I'll just go into the treatment protocol of a malaria patient. Again, it's a very, very important, which is not sometimes followed in practice. So we have to keep three things in the treatment. One is to alleviate the symptoms, to prevent relapse. I think that is very, very important. I look into that and also to the prevent symptoms. So what factors you have to keep it in mind when you are, again, uh, again, uh, I, I request all of you to remember there's nothing called clinical malaria. I remember when we were undergraduate or PG students, they used to write clinical malaria, clinical malaria. Today, the gold standard of diagnosing malaria is a smear study. So if the smear study is negative, please repeat. So we cannot, in today's evidence-based medicine, we cannot treat a case as empirical malaria, except in emergencies, except in emergencies that are discussed later. So we have to keep the what type of infection, what is the severity, what is the status of the host, pregnant or not, or with comorbids like that. So this is a very simple slide, I'm sure all of you know, but I just highlight the point. All privates, again in Tamil Nadu, we know, except in Ramnath, Ramnath, maybe Chennai, I not know about Coimbatore, few districts, two or three districts, we do see falciparum. Otherwise, across the board, it's a vivax, which is chloroquine sensitive. Again, many of us may think, you know, chloroquine is not acting. So we straight away start uh, cortisonate for even a vivax malaria that should be avoided. Because if the parasite develops resistance against artesinate, we are going to have a big problem. So please, Treat vivax, simple vivax, uncomplicated. We can. Uh, sir, not audible, sir. Sir, you are not audible, sir. Ronandan, sir, please unmute yourself. You are not audible, sir. It is already unmute only, sir. Can you just uh, call, sir? Uh, I'll call him, sir. I'm calling him. Yeah. Sorry, he has left, sir. Huh? Sandil, sir, he has left. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He will be joining shortly. Sir. Just, 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 we are calling him. I'm calling him, sir. I'm calling him. Remember. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Uh, Sarah is going to rejoin shortly. And meanwhile, we recommend meanwhile, all of We can ask the questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is there are any questions? You, no, sir. They can ask. Two minutes, sir. Sarah is joining now, sir. Just uh, for information sake, I request all our members to put a ma mail also regarding the payments for creditors. As there is a restriction of 500 participants, we are not able to take more participants. But uh, still, as and when people are leery, few members are joining. So we will be open till 6, 6.15. So kindly put your details in the chat box. We will extend the session also. So also kindly put a mail to the already mentioned yeah. ID regarding the payments and other things. And uh, this is going to be the fellowship course. So we request all our members to join the fellowship course. All our speak, both the speakers are faculties and our chief coordinator, Dr. Nevanathan sir is there. So we will discuss at the end. Sir, have you joined, sir? Sir, he's joining. Ravanathan, yes. sir, have you joined? Sir, you can just discuss with your, uh, you can start the session, sir, QA session, maybe some. Uh... I request sir, our members to. Meeting, sir, rejoin one regular. Yeah. Uh, Jain, sir. Okay. Sir, mean, meanwhile, can you answer some of the questions, sir? sir yes, I request yes. the members to put forth yeah. the questions. Sir is joining. 
Till then, yeah. there are some any questions you can put it in the chat box. Uh, those who want the slides, please note down my number nine eight four double two nine eight four double two triple one seven nine triple one seven nine one 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 seven nine. You can ask the questions in the chat box. There was one question. If the child is not tolerating oral paracetamol, can we give suppository? Yes, you can give paracetamol suppository. Dose is 10 milligram per kg per dose. You can repeat it once in six hours. You can use suppository. And another question was how to register for infectious disease certificate course. I think you can contact our secretary, IMA CGP, uh, Secretary Dr. Sindhil, sir, uh, you can contact him or you can contact our IMA office. Uh, you can contact Dr. S Mr. Selaturai. So we'll display the numbers uh, in the chat box. You can note down the number. You can contact Dr. Sindhil, Secretary or office, Selaturai. Sindhil, sir, sir, sir you can note, note. I request all our members to, first of all, they could be an IMA member. So once they are IMA member, they can again become a CGP member. So it is a very simple procedure. You can just send the request form through your branch secretary or president. And once you are a member, you are eligible to join the course. So all these things can happen within maybe two, three days. So any query, you can just get those things. Already members of the IMA can directly become member of IMA CGP and join the course. And in the course fees details, will be circulating in the your uh, regional uh, local IMA. You can contact your IMA regional president, uh, district president. They will give you the uh, details. And also you can contact the uh, Tamil Nadu IAP, IMA office. Mr. Chelladurai, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the number of Chelladurai. You can know it uh, send it in the chat group. Yes, sir. Just now I'm doing it. Yeah. You can note down Chelladurai's number 944 944 561752. I'll once again repeat 944 561752. He is Mr. Chelladurai, manager of IMA headquarters, Chennai CGP uh, manager. You can contact him. You can get the IMA form. You can give, get CGP form. You can also get infectious disease certificate course form. So you can get all the three. And uh, as I told you, our uh, IMA CGP certificate course is, uh, this course is headed by Professor Dr. Pranthi Sami sir, former director of public health. And uh, it is uh, ably guided by Dr. Professor Ramanandan sir, Madras Medical College. Internal medicine professor and uh, by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mohan Kumar from CDC is working in Delhi, and uh, Dr. Suri Kumar, microbiology professor, and myself. So, we have got we are going to have it for six months' course. There will be going to be international speakers, national speakers, eminent scientists who are going to talk on infectious disease. This certificate course will to totally definitely change your practice. So I request all of you to join this certificate course. Those who want to know more detail about that course, you can contact me. Once again, I'll tell you my number, 98422-1179-98422-1179. You can contact me for any questions. You can send me a message. Sir, unmute, sir. Kindly unmute, sir. Can you share the telephone numbers in the chat, please? Yeah, yes, madam. We are doing that. And uh, meanwhile, the course uh, duration is almost uh, close to six months. And then every month we'll be having a class. It will be majority online and there will be a few on-site classes, which will be a workshop kind of thing. So all the classes will be awarded with credit hours. So the entire stretch might stretch 10 to 12 credit hours. And this program is awarded with 0.5 credit hours. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
sir we can proceed with the question and answer session sir qa session please sir request everyone to mute yourself those who want to ask question can ask directly or you can put it in the chat box chandil in the chat box for questions can paarenga sir we are not able to scroll sir it's getting stuck because of the messages i request our members to put a question directly sir solan sir please sir please sir i am a private setup sir your good name sir so the pediatric yes i am most of the pediatric cases yeah dr veera pandian i am a cgp regular member sir நல்லா இருக்கீங்க சார் ஐ அம் எ பிரைவேட் செட்டப் நல்லா இருக்க நல்லா இருக்க मोस्ट ஆஃப் தி பீடியாட்ரிக் கேसेस சார் আফ터 3 to 4 days after fever சிபிசி கவுண்ட் ரிவீல்ஸ் லோ பிளேட்லெட் கவுண்ட் அபார்ட் फ्रॉम டெங்கி பட் ஹவ் ஷல் ஐ ப்ரோசீட் சார் எஸ் சார் இட்ஸ் a very good question sir first remember when you do cbc after third day if you have a low wbc count that means there is a viral infection this low wbc count means the the viruses are multiplying inside the wbc so our body wants to reduce the viral load so what the body does is down regulates the production of wbc by sending information to the marrow to produce stop producing wbcs so there will be a transient leukopenia which will get auto corrected after the viruses go away so it is a protective mechanism leukopenia you need not worry number 1 thrombocytopenia as i told you the same reason many of the viruses as they enter our body enter our body our body produces igm antibodies igm antibodies are supposed to destroy the virus but unfortunately platelets has got the same molecular pattern as that of virus instead of destroying the virus our own antibodies destroy our own platelets it is equal to itp so what will happen is platelet count will be low but the child will be normal So always do not look at the platelet count in any clinical setting look at the no, child no, no. if the child is active taking food child is safe or bright passing urine well no danger signs do not treat thrombocytopenia it will get corrected in a matter of weeks so do not treat thrombocytopenia so the message is you are whenever you see a cbc please look at the hematocrit if the hematocrit is very high probably chances that you are dealing with dengue like illness so in those children you have to be very very cautious so if the hematocrit is very high you need to admit them right in front or if there is a ongoing capillary leak as uh, as evidenced by reduced urination abdominal pain uh, you need to keep the child inside and monitor so in cbc you have to look at the hematocrit please please sir go ahead Yeah. Raghunandan sir has joined. Please yeah, go yeah. ahead. Sorry yes, sir, actually, I am I am calling from uh, government dental hospital and an uh, officer uh, switch off my uh, uh, internet. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, we found yeah, out. No, please no, go ahead sir. Process. You can sir. So yeah, I'll yeah, just try to the... finish in another five to seven minutes sir. Yes sir. So yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. Sir. We just yes. now learnt about Vivax, but I think that we have to uh, now we'll go to the falciparum uncomplicated. Again, as far as uh, as uh, falciparum uncomplicated cases. It is one of the diseases that can be cured in three days. Three days, they say, one infectious disease, a severe problem that can be cured in three days is falciparum. You get, you give day one artesanate, day two artesanate, and you give uh, day one. You also give uh, sulfadoxin with pyrethmine. Second day you give artesanate, and third day you give the uh, uh, primetoin. So this is one uh, one disease that you can be cured in. uh second day or to snail and third day you just have to snail so you can cure in 3 days so of course we are going to the complicated malaria again they say complicated malaria is a medical emergency where the patient has acute febrile illness becoming altered sensorium or patient throwing seizures or landing up in coma multiple problems can come but on clinical basis if you are diagnosing a complicated malaria IV artesanate is going to save the life of the patient. They say it is biomass parasite, hyperparasitemia, clogs the capillaries of the cerebral vessels, cause anoxia. Similarly, anoxia to the kidneys, anoxia to the lungs, like that. So, hyperparasitemia is cleared by your dose of artesanate, which is a life-saving drug in medical emergency of malaria. So, before you refer the patient, also if you are going to start artesanate on clinical basis, it is going to save the. life of the patient artesanate or the other drug what we can start is the 
quinine also can be quinine also be can be started as i mentioned about cerebral malaria again one of the differential diagnosis of uh, cerebral malaria is your hyperpyrexia convulsions can be there and again hypoglycemia one of the common infection that can trigger hypoglycemia in acute febrile illness is your cerebral malaria and also remember iv quinine can also cause hypoglycemia that is what they say when you know, whenever you are giving quinine give it in a dextrose containing solutions so these are the others again they can present as a dic and spontaneous bleeding acute pulmonary edema like that so we have discussed that finally we we'll just touch upon this crop typhus again it's another common problem i think uh, in krishnagiri vellur and e road area again it's a infectious disease that is easily treatable caused by a para, uh, rickets ill organisms most important uh, symptoms are fever eschar lymphadenopathy cough chills rash and headache again it is a disease of 3 weeks duration usually the first week patient is going around but the second week is a week of complications they can develop uh, slurring neurological complications like deafness difficult rigidity respiratory is very very important each infectious disease has a characteristic complication which is unique for that particular infection for if you look at that angle scrub it's known to cause ards that is adult respiratory distress syndrome or acute respiratory distress syndrome where patient comes with acute non cardiogenic pulmonary edema again if you are going to put them on doxycycline today we are getting iv doxy also patient will come out like anything so patient will just walk out of your critical care unit that's what they say so it's one of the disease which can be easily treated if picked up early but we do sometimes lose these patients if the diagnosis is delayed and patient lands up in multi organ dysfunction again as i said it can involve multi involvement in the form of cardiac myocarditis cardiac failures and acute renal failure like that so i think treatment is very simple like macrolides like azithro or doxycycline sometimes we use rifampicin also so whenever a acute febrile illness comes in our private practice just to revise what all we have just now discussed go of the chronology which started even fever would not have been the first symptoms it would have been a different things so go into the chronology of symptoms drug history any surgical many of our now today they are keeping stents for various reasons if a foreign body is there in our body again it can trigger some infections again animal bites prosthetic implanted occupation again zoonotic today who is telling around 60 to 70% of infections are of zoonotic nature that is why who has come out with a concept called one health no longer we address human health in isolation we have to address human health along with animal health as well as on environmental issues and all our recent infections are of zoonotic origin so please look into the travel history also is very very important in fact recently we have reported few cases where they have come travel to goa or travel to north india is very very crucial because sometimes they carry the infections from there of course all the comorbids that keep it in mind i always i already mentioned about whether the patient had covid and vaccination status so check all the head to foot examination look for rash purpura nodules eschars and eye examination look for pallor jaundice subcongenital these are what all we have just now said it can be revised in this slides so look for clubbing tenderness genitalia leaf you know all these things are very very important as i said every day you examine the patient as if you are seeing for the first time so always rule out a many to last week also we picked up a case of uh, infective adenocarditis patient had a small vsd patient is around 60 years old patient never had any cardiac symptoms but he presented with prolonged fever treated by everybody on auscultation we picked up the murmur and blood culture proved it to be infective adenocarditis so meticulous examination is always a, a tool which will give you good results again abdomen pain again regarding dengue sir was repeatedly mentioning about abdominal pain again that is a very very important warning sign if somebody asked me why abdominal pain in dengue one it because of tender hepatomegaly a calculus cholecystitis bleeding very very important is bleeding progressive ascites or bowel ischemia so there are so many reasons why a dengue patient can go for abdominal pain 
So all investigations, sir was mentioning about when to do the CBC and other investigations. If the fever is more than three days or four days, you start investigating. For one or two days, we can just wait. But sometimes your basic investigation will help you, especially in dengue, even though the day two or day three investigation may be normal, that will be used as a baseline for our later interpretation. Because the platelet was, say, around two lakhs on day two, and is the 60-day platelet is 40,000, definitely we know the term. Similarly, PCV, pack cell volume hematocrit uh, increases. Similarly, in dengue, you can have secondary infection, secondary bacterial sepsis can set in. So initially, you may have a leukopenia, 2,000 total count, but when the patient is having persistent fever, maybe you can see the leukocytosis in a dengue patient also. Again, one more caution I want to tell our friends is the mixer infection. Many times, 30 to 40% of times, we have more than one infection also in the same patient. So keep that in mind also. So judiciously use of investigations. In fact, I would be uh, a little bit concerned about the use of CT scans in COVID. I think we have misused the CT scans during COVID time. Even before patient goes for RT-PCR, he is going for a CT test. I think it's not needed at all. Only if the patient is not improving or patient is worsening, CT test is indicated in case of COVID. So simple X-ray is more than enough. So always look at the prevention and uh, prophylactic aspects also. Sarah was mentioning about vaccines. I think we have a big role in the days to come about the use of, in fact, about the even the influenza vaccines, about the, we have a quadrivalent vaccines now available. That has to be done, especially of the high risk group, especially when you're talking about H3N2, especially people who are more than 65 years, pregnant women, those on immunosuppressed children, definitely they are at high risk. And of course, healthcare workers, we should always keep, whenever we are talking about the infections, we have to protect our healthcare workers. So I'll just try to conclude. We have already mentioned about, again, uh, summer is going to come. Definitely we have to keep in mind, even though it's not a very common problem in our part compared to North India, but heat related disorders in the form of heat stroke and hyperparaxia should be kept in mind. These are the high risk groups. So always so, we go by sometimes syndromic approach. This is summary okay. of a fever, fever with rash. Fever with thrombocytopenia, fever with jaundice, fever with bleeding, fever with altered sensorium. So some kind of this approach also helps us many times in our clinical approach. These are the some rare causes okay. of acute febrile illness that we have to keep it in mind. Okay. So take home okay. message, okay. always okay. diagnosis should be postulated and the unexpected lab must be cross-checked with repeated when necessary. Serial physical examination, I al also told. And misuse of antibiotics, again, Sarah has mentioned about unnecessary use of antibiotics because antimicrobial resistance is another bigger challenge that we have already started facing. So please use the antibiotics always judiciously. So these are the challenges that we are going. That's uh, just now I mentioned about the zoonotic nature. So we are, we are going to face much more emerging and re-emerging infections. Again, before I conclude, our friends that recently we had a re-emergence of diphtheria in the community. So be aware, as a student, I have not seen, seen one case, but the last two, three years, I have seen more than 50 cases of diphtheria. So we have to be prepared for the, not only the new emerging diseases, some of the diseases which we thought has gone is also re-emerging. So please be aware of all these things. Please be aware of our friends of wild animals or even pet animals that can be the triggering thing. So all these problems, which I have just now mentioned has been captured. Educating the public is also going to be a bigger role for our primary care physicians. Educating the press and media is also going to be a problem. Thank you, thank you. I'm sorry about the interruption in the middle, but I hope that I could give a holistic picture how to approach a case of AFI. And if any questions are there, I will be happy to take it. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Much. Thank you, sir. There are some yeah. questions thank in the you. chat box which I uh, mainly pertaining to pediatrics, uh, which I'll uh, quickly run through. So if you have any questions, you can directly unmute and ask, or you could put it in the chat box. The first question is Oseltamil syrup and the dose. Oseltamil is available as syrup that contains, one ml contains 12 milligram. It is available in the brand name of Fluvir, Fluvia, 
So one ml contains 12 milligrams. So it is available as capsule, 75 milligrams per capsule. Others, I request everyone everyone to mute yourself and the second question is regarding in the peripheral smear eosinophils suppose if you have a cell counter you will not see directly eosinophils you will see monocytes monocytes in the cell counter is eosinophils please remember if the there is a eosinophenia if the eosinophil count is zero probably you are dealing with typhoid number one if there is a eosinophilia if the eosinophil count is 25 or 18 or 27, you are probably dealing with malaria, fever with chills and rigor, splenomegaly, anemia, eosinophilia, malaria, eosinophenia, typhoid. And the next question was white all. Please don't do white all before seventh day. And uh, do not give inference to white all. If the white all, both O and H, to say it is typhoid, it should be both O and H should be more than 1 in 160. That's very, very important. Sometimes the lab technician will underline O80, H60, like that, underline in reading, and then tell the patient that it is typhoid or RMB stage. You would have done typhoid on day three or day four. You will underline and tell that RMB stage. There is nothing called RMB stage. That is typhoid is there or not. So you should entertain only when O and H are positive more than one in 160. Typhoid viral should be done only after seventh day. That's very, very important. And another important question they have asked is about cough syrup. Please, as I told you, don't use cough syrup that contains polypharmacy. Multiple ingredients in a single bottle do not use. You can use cough syrup. If the cough is disturbing. Sometimes some children will have non-disturbing cough that will not disturb the activity, sleep, or they will not have post vomiting. In that case, you need not suppress all the cough. If the mild cough is mild, doesn't disturb day-to-day -day activities, you can ignore the cough. Sometimes some children will have psychogenic cough. It will be present only from Monday to Saturday. On Sunday, cough will disappear. It will disappear in the night also. Though psychogenic cough is common, particularly after COVID, after the school has started, they want to uh, escape the exams of the school. They will start producing cough, psychogenic headache, psychogenic abdominal pain. Many things are coming, so don't fall prey to the psychogenic cough. Uh, next question was about typhus. Sometimes whenever you suspect typhus, you have to take a history whether they have gone to some village setting or they have con had contact with the animals or they have gone to riverbed. And if you have to examine the child thoroughly behind the ears, in the groin, in the gluteal region, in the, below the scrotum, all those hidden areas you have to see, you have to see for pressure which is present around 60 to 70 percent of the cases. Then clinically, you have to examine if there is a relative bradycardia, splenomegaly. Then you have to, oh, if, if these things are there, you need to think about typhus. And typhus, it is a single shot treatment in children less than eight years. You can give astromycin 10 milligram per kg weight. Children, older children, more than eight years, you can give doxycycline 5 milligram per kg weight, OD for a period of five to seven days. Any other questions you can ask? Dr. Raghunandan, sir, see whether there are adult questions you can ask. Uh, Hello, many of you ask about uh, morning, Dr. Neminathan's number. I like to tell you once again my number. Please note it down. 98422 111 1179. 98422 And always, always have Dr. Sendil, CGP secretary number. He is a very nice person. Uh, we should uh, we should all appreciate Dr. Sendhil for his efforts to bring a history in the history of IMA Tamil Nadu, IMA CGP, bringing 500 doctors. It's a big thing. We should all appreciate him. So you can always contact him for any questions related to credit hours or IMA CGP dis certificate courses. So this infectious disease course is very, very important to your practice. I like the professor of medicine, Dr. Raghunandan, to say a few words about our course, sir. Dr. Yes, Raghunandan, sir, yeah. please. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In fact, before I tell about the course, there was one question on how to manage the persistent cough and throat pain uh, following a virus. I think that is especially this uh, emerging H3N2, we are seeing that cough is persisting even for two weeks. 
we was following the directory of the thing. I think as 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 Sarah slightly mentioned out that we have to give us a mono a simple drug to suppress the cough. Don't put mixing of drugs and also reassurance. You no, know, it, it it will be there for quite some time. Maybe it will recover. Maybe in another two three days like that. So reassurance. Maybe one more problem many of these people may have is post nasal drip. That also triggers frequent coughs in these people who have recovered from acute viral infection. So please address with uh, treating the post nasal drip also. And coming back to our uh, course, again, I think this is a third year we are uh, running. So when we started itself, we had this COVID, so we could not have a uh, physical contact programs, but it went on very well that we could rope in so many. In fact, uh, one of our strength of our uh, program is uh, all the important sessions are taken by the well-known experts in that particular field. For example, if it's going to be a, a dengue and other things, Sarah will bring from Thailand, Madam, who is the authority on dengue management like that. For, for, uh, similarly, HIV, we have people from Dr. Kumar Swami from YRG, uh, Chennai. So like that, uh, for uh, any tuberculosis related thing, we bring people from tuberculosis research center like that. So we have the experts. In fact, we have in some of the learning sessions, we have a panel discussion on very important programs. We have a structured module for each disease. And also we have a periodical assessment. And also we have to submit a, a dissertation like that, where you have to choose two topics of interest of infectious disease. And we have a uh, live viva examination like that. So this program is getting popular among the primary care doctors. In fact, I'm happy to say that people, not only practicing doctors have joined, people from other specialty like microbiologists, even I have seen two, three surgeons, orthopedic people, a lot of pediatricians are joining this program from that side. So I, I would say that this program, in fact, when I saw the number of people attending this program is around 500. And some of them could not join because the thing is already full. It shows the interest of the primary care doctors in learning and understanding the management of acute infections and also chronic infections. I'm sure. And also infection prevention. I think that is a key area that we should know how to keep our clinic, how to keep our hospitals uh, as per the norms, how to keep what, what are the precautions that we have to take. Similarly, how to protect our healthcare workers how to dispose the biomedical waste, how to get it licensed. So all these things also, this program will help you and guide you how to get your license like that. So I strongly recommend that you join this program and uh, sure you will have a very fruitful learning in days to come. Thank you, sir. Thank you for briefing the, our course. Uh, friends, I'm sure when you join this course, definitely your knowledge will level will go up and your success of practice will definitely go up and there will be statistically significant growth in your, both in the scientific practice and also your uh, financial aspects. We, I hope all of you will join the course as early as possible. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was a question about papaya leaf. Please, uh, can I give papaya leaf to improve the platelet count? Please remember, you need not treat the platelet count. Please remember, even if you don't treat, automatically platelet count will go up, come back normal. If you give papaya leaf and the platelet counts comes up, the credit will go to papaya leaf, it will not go to you. So, treating a thrombocytopenia is like treating a jaundiced child for the yellow eyes. It's like putting eye drops for the yellow eyes in a jaundiced child. In a jaundiced child, pathology is in the liver. Do not treat the eye. So, treating a thrombocytopenia in a dengue child is treating like a jaundice for eye for the jaundice. Do not give papaya leaf. That's an important message. Sometimes each people will ask for you some question. Can I give this fruit that uh, platelet count will come up? This That fruit, the platelet count will come up. You have to tell them strict no. So we have to treat the child, not the platelets. Good evening, yes. sir. Yes. I am an old student, 2021 Damodaran. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Everything yes, sir. is Younger, So I was Sanjana very happy. Dubai, no, sir. Young and the patient, 2021, first batch, first batch student. Sending yes, are you from India now or Dubai? No, I put on work on the test, sir. Dubai. Yes, sir. Now, second, second diabetes, Murchitipa, 
தேர்ட் ஃபேமிலி மெடிசின் ஜாயின் பண்ணேன் சார் வெரி எனி क्वेश्चन சார் எஸ் சார் சார் பேரஸ்டமால் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் வி ஆர் गिविंग ஒரு 3 hours ஸ்பஞ்சிங் கொடுத்து நல்லா கன்வீ பண்ணாலும் இன்டர்மிட்டன் மெஃப்டால் கொடுக்கலாமா சார் சார் வெரி குட் क्वेश्चन please never give any other after 3 hours what i am doing after 3 hours giving sponging still because of the virus it's not coming down the parents are becoming very panic so yeah. to satisfy them i am giving mephtal temporarily so the important message is do not satisfy the patients what you have to tell them is fever is not a disease per se it is underlying disease that causes fever you have to educate them by giving mephenemic acid this is mephenemic acid sir please unmute sir sir please unmute yourself name in other sir you have to unmute sir please unmute sir so the Nemina, answer is uh, yes, uh, uh, do not give any to satisfy the parents tell them that fever is a manifestation of underlying disease fever will take 3 days 4 days to come down if we give more medicines other than paracetamol you are going to harm the child you have to tell them right in the front so don't satisfy them by, by giving mephenemic acid mephenemic acid per se is a drug that can produce seizures it's a seizurogenic drug in a child with a febrile seizures potential these children will throw seizures after giving mephenemic acid as i told you ibuprofen mephenemic acid they all got uh, they can produce antiplatelet action they can have a severe thrombocytopenia these children who have received mephenemic acid ibuprofen will start bleeding even with a normal platelet count the platelet count will be normal 1.5 lakhs child have massive bleeding just because of these drugs so you will land up in problem the patient also will land up in problem never try to satisfy them the who says do not use nsaids use only paracetamol we all should everyone all the 500 doctors in this meeting should talk the same language everybody should use only paracetamol so uh, sometimes you will land up in problem then only your practice will be gone so never use shortcuts to reduce fever tell them that fever per se is not a disease tell them that it will take a longer time for the fever to come down if you tell them 5 days the fever comes down by third day they will be happy and the most important thing is more than fever danger signs are important most important thing is more than paracetamol ors is important hydration is very very important if you tell them convince them tell them by third day the fever comes down rest of his life the patient will come to you they will know this doctor is a knowledgeable doctor will not give im injection will not harm the child will not give unnecessary antibiotic for the first 3 days you will have difficulty once you win that child once you win that parents they will come for the rest of the time lifetime they will also bring their neighbors also so first 3 days you have to be very very straight forward and honest tell them that this is what my textbook says and tell them this is what science says like that you have to tell them frankly thank you sir thank you very much sir sir what is the maximum dose of paracetamol we can use sir sir maximum dose is 15 mg per kg per dose the maximum allowable dose is 80 mg per kg per day if you exceed paracetamol more than that you can have dengue and also paracetamol toxicity so do not go for higher dose paracetamol so as sir, i told you paracetamol is allergy dengue is a hepatotrophic virus so already there will be hepatotropism there will be hepatocyte loss the uh, paracetamol is a hepatotoxic drug by giving heavier doses you will land up in hepatotoxicity so please in dengue try as far as possible to limit your dose to 10 mg per kg per dose maximum is 50 mg 15 15 mg per kg per dose not exceeding 80 mg per kg per day sir if paracetamol is allergic na sir sir if it is allergic it's probably not because of paracetamol it is because of the incipients some of the coloring agents some of the ingredients that they use in the paracetamol syrup you can give paracetamol tablet or suppository okay uh, good evening sir uh, good evening. sir my, my sister is in uk okay. and sponging is uh, prohibited there kudukka mukkas vandu kudukkudanu solirukanga ipo 
பாராசிட்டமால் மட்டும் தான் கொடுக்குறாங்க टेंपरेचर 103 102 க்கு மேல போகுது அந்த மாதிரி நம்ம ப்ரூஃப் பண்ணி கொடுக்கலாமாங்க சார் இஸ் இட் அட்வைசபிள் லைக் not not required suppose if we know the pathology probably is bacterial for example pneumonia irukudhu typhoid irukudhu andha maari illa ibuprofen can be given safely at okay, the correct sir. dose 10 mg per kg weight but okay. preferably if you know it is bacterial if it is no it is viral please don't use ibuprofen particularly if you know it is dengue please do not use ibuprofen so if you have a doubt it is viral don't try to reduce using antibiotic any other antibiotic other than paracetamol and another important thing uk va irundhal seri sadharana inga tamil nadu la irukkura or gramam irundhal seri whatever we talk that should be evidence there is no level 1 evidence for the use of tepid sponging so tepid sponging vandu ipothiki one level 1 evidence illa india la tamil nadu la tepid sponging vandu nama scientific advice panna venda but illa onnu harm illa anala we need to do some homework anala vandu ஐஸ் வாட்டர் யூஸ் பண்ண வேண்டாம் லியூகோம் வாட்டர் யூஸ் பண்ணி ஸ்பாஞ்சிங் பண்ணுங்கன்னு சொல்லலாம் பட் யூ ஹேட் டெல் தம் தட் இஸ் நோ சயின்டிபிக் எவிடன்ஸ் அதையும் ஒரு வார்த்தை சொல்லிரணும் அது அது சொல்லிட்டு சொல்லணும் பட் ஆஸ் டாக்டர்ஸ் वी मस्ट नो देयर இஸ் நோ லெவல் 1 எவிடன்ஸ் ஃபார் தி யூஸ் ஆஃப் டெபிட் ஸ்பாஞ்சிங் இன் ஃபீவர் யூஸ் only பாராசிட்டமால் மெயின்டெய்ன் ஹைட்ரேஷன் வெயிட் ஃபார் தி ஃபீவர் டு செட்டில் டவுன் தட்ஸ் தி மோஸ்ட் இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் மெசேஜ் थैங்க்ஸ் சார் அண்ட் தேர்ஸ் எ क्वेश्चन லைக் ஹைட்ரேஷன் மீன்ஸ் hydration means we can give or solution or plain yeah. water what sure yeah you can give or as or homemade or as like tender coconut water rice kanji buttermilk more parup thanni and the mari edu venal kudukalam it should contain salt and sugar so they are called home or as homemade or as the dose of or as is young child 50 ml per hour old child adolescent child 100 ml per hour very simple Thank just keep giving or as day and night fever will come down child will not lead into complications particularly uh, immune complex mediated vasculitis leak la majority varadu ors will reduce the need for hospitalization sir is uh, is there any antiviral activity for azithromycin or doxycycline sir is there any antiviral activity for azithromycin yeah it's a very good question sometimes in dengue children who are becoming sick on the third day fourth day at the time of disappear uh, dis- effervescence of fever they have uh, they going to shock because of two reasons one is through the normal pathway there is a leak and they going for tissue hypoxemia shock that is the normal pathway that is called leaky air pathway and the other pathway is complement pathway in which tumor necrosis factor uh, your uh, complement all those things to, uh, your tn up uh, Uh, all those things will get activated so your doxycycline has got anti tnf activity anti it has got il6 activity so it will reduce the chance of going in for cytokine storm and also as dr raghunandan sir told there are around 30% of the time we do see dengue with mixed infection like leptospirosis strep typhus in those cases if you have a doubt whether it is scab or dengue or when you have a Uh, when you have it looks something oscillating between those two disease you can confidently give doxycycline but do not misuse doxycycline in every patient pardon me yes sir narajan please go ahead ah uh, only why the sponging the abolition in nhs uh, london you know the, there, there is no abolition for for uh, any any action in medicine there should be science so what the latest evidence based science says is there is no potential benefit out of doing tepid sponging Okay, okay. There is no harm, but there is no benefit. Okay. Okay, Nimi. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah. there is a harm. Suppose the mother takes ice water and does tepid sponging, which the, normally many of the uh, mothers do. They want oh. to reduce the fever. That will cause, this ice water will reduce narrowing of the blood vessels in the skin. It will cause more hyperpyrexia. Instead of reducing the fever, child will have child with 1 or 2 degree will going for 1 or 5 and going for hyperpyrexia shock heat heat stroke just by tepid sponging it will produce vaso constriction so you should not do that's the reason sometimes this will produce harm so that's the reason it's not advised okay me okay me any other questions so i request all the members to join this uh, infectious disease certificate course so when please is... remember 
uh, uh, we have got only limited seats. You have to join as early as possible. Yeah. So please contact IMA office immediately. So when it's when it's starting, sir, from which month? So probably it will be starting in the next month. So as soon as we collect all the members, we'll start it. So you have to join as early as possible. See, actually, we have inaugurated the course today, and uh, Sam will be starting the regular classes from April, maybe first week. We have still what time. What is the course so fee, sir? Yeah, course fee is twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand. Yeah, and I request all our members to contact your branch presidents and secretaries because they are all equipped with all the information. So they are the key important persons. So they can help you very easily. Of course, we are also there to guide you. Okay, so does this uh, course uh, will be for every month, or it's only for it starts every month, or it starts or oh, only uh, twice in a year? It will be in, twice in a year. Or once in a year. Oh, only once, once in a year. Yeah, only once. Thank you so much. Any more questions, members? I request any more further questions. You can shoot up. Yes, and then you can. Yes, sir. Fine, sir. So now I request our member, Dr. Virbandi, sir, to deliver vote of thanks. Thank you, thank you, Sandil sir. First, first of all, as a participant. I have to thank our CGP chairman Sengul Don Sir and Sengul Sir for their nice topic at the right time. I I once again thank both of them. As a CGP member, I have to thank our uh, state president Dr. Sandeep Parizal, our state secretary Dr. Ennathiya Tiarajan Sir, incoming president and immediate past president for their kind cooperation in attendance. I have to thank our past national president Dr. Jailal Sir and Dean CGP Ramesh Babu Sir. CGP representative Jay Kumar sir for their presence, and I must thank our uh, faculties for their lectures. David Adams sir is an enthusiastic personality in all the academic activities. I must no, thank him, Mr. David Adams sir, and also I must thank our Raghunandan sir. This was an elaborate, knowledgeable person. I uh, I can again, I want to thank the thank him. For his nice cooperation and explain all the things in a simple way for, for our understanding, sir. I once again I thank all the participants and I will request all the participants to join this course. Our IMA CGP has done a lot of work for our benefit of our IMA and for the benefit of the IMA members. Once again, and thank you all, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. The session will be still active for another 20 25 minutes. Because many of us couldn't log in and share the details for record for the TNM security tower. So kindly post your details. So we will be closing after 20 25 minutes. And I request all our members who are in need of credit tower to pay the amount to the mentioned account and also send the details to the mail ID, not to the WhatsApp number or individual number. Kindly send to the mail ID. So, thank Dr. you. Dr. Agunandran here, I thank the uh, Dr. Sendil Kumar and Dr. Sengutuvan and all the IMA office bearers for organizing. Thank you very much, sir. Can I leave, thank sir? You, sir? Thank you, very thank much, you sir. sir. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Thank, uh, you, thank, you, sir. You, sir. thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. I am also leaving, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sendil, sir. I am also leaving, sir. Sendil, sir. Yes, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I totally uh, participated in the two talks. Excellent talk. Congratulations to the, both the speakers. They did an excellent yes, job. And uh, congratulations to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Yes sir. yes, sir. And also we are having our next CGP course inauguration, 23rd of this month, which is on next Thursday. So that will be on fellowship course in certificate in fellowship in infectious, sorry, infectious diseases today. And that will be pulmonary respiratory infection and other uh, thing. So I request all our members to join next week also. We will be sharing the details soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
yes sir so the session will be just leaving it for another 20 25 minutes sir so we'll get the all the details then we'll end the session sir so i'm keeping it idle sir Thank, thank you all for the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank Bye, you, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Right. We will meet.
நல்லா சுடுத்துணை ஆற வச்சு குடிங்க தயிரும் ஒரு வேண்டாம் இருமல்ல வருதா இருமல்ல வருதா 
அம்மா எப்ப நல்லா சாப்பிட்டு மாத்திரை போடுங்க பேரு இருந்தா சளி வருதா குத்தி குத்தி இருமல் வருதா